This is Off Planet Radio. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I'm Emily Moyer, and I have the honor of being back here with two of my favorite guys. Uh, Randy Moggins, of course, is with me. Hello. Good morning, Randy. Good morning, everybody. And um, we are here to uh, do sort of round two of our conversation with David Martin. We had a tremendous response and his work is starting to get more and more attention, which was the, the purpose uh, of what we did. But there are some follow up questions and conversations that need to be had. So he is back here with us today and uh, we're going to spend the first segment sort of updating some of the information and answering some of the questions that came forward um, after the first show and some things that have happened since then. And in the second part segment for our page Patrons, and please join us there if you haven't. We are going to start imagineering the future. So, David Martin, welcome back to Off Planet Radio. Emily, Randy, so good to be back with you guys. It's, it, it seems like it's been a whole viral strain ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're compressing time as we go here. We put you on the uh, on the treadmill, so to speak, and we've gone watch David because he's the Energizer Bunny, and you have been absolutely everywhere. Yeah, well, you know, the, the funny thing is, and, and I, I, have, I have celebrated this and I will continue to celebrate this. The work that we're doing is to try to encourage people to independently first act in the form of becoming more aware. And then second, act in terms of acting on that awareness to reclaim their liberty. Um, and, and as we go through this conversation, I'm sure we're going to touch on those things, but but I really am appreciating both of you guys for what you've done, opening up the space, having a broader conversation. Love the network of people that you have reached into because a lot of them have reached back out. And so the community that's being built is great. And thank you both for making that happen. I appreciate it. Oh, thank Absolutely. you. All right. Yeah, that's uh, awesome. So we're going, th let's kind of thread through the, the last, I guess, 10, 12, 14 days in terms of new information coming out, the last time we spoke, uh, we didn't have the documents that you had released. Those were, I think, pending on the YouTube release the following yeah. day because we recorded that on a Monday. And then um, since then, you've done an additional video, an additional uh, butterfly. So we have two of those in the queue since the last time we talked. But the most important thing was clearly, at least in my mind, how you broke down in the video the progression of this coronavirus conspiracy and began to delineate how we got to where we are as a result of actions that had taken place as far back as 2003. So right. those documents give the listeners, and there will be links with this video everywhere that it goes, down there at the bottom in the little box, click more, and then look for the links. I put those documents up on my Google Drive because people were having trouble finding them. Yeah. So we're linking to those independently. But the important thing is to get those documents, read those documents, share those documents, and then use those documents as templates to go out to the necessary contacts and the people who need to be noticed that we have a bigger problem than what's being addressed on the public side of this right now. So yeah. you can so, update. So, yeah, the, uh, listen, a quick recap. Um, what I've been doing over the last uh, couple weeks beyond now numerous interviews and, and writing and, and so forth, um, I've, I've conducted a new and deeper inquiry into all of the actors and who's their financial connection going back to a date that you're not gonna expect me to say, which is 2001, which actually predates what we think of, we know as SARS. Um, it turns out that I, I found two grants. I'm gonna give you the grant numbers for the fact checkers who like to take stuff down if you don't back it up. So here we go. Uh, two grants, 
uh, GM63228 and A123946. Um, those two grants, which actually are, are sponsoring research that was taking place around 2000 and 2001, before we had the Asian first SARS outbreak. So this, this predates SARS, uh, resulted in a patent that was US patent 7279327. That number again, 7279327. Ironically, <clears throat> that patent was the first time that we see a specific effort to commercially control not only coronavirus as a virus, but more problematically, coronavirus as an adaptable virus that can be amplified for various forms of mutagenicity, meaning that there are spike protein properties and there are receptor properties that make coronavirus particularly interesting as both a unnatural way of infecting people and an unnatural way of increasing virulence of a natural substance. Now, the reason I go back to these patents is because they really are the foundational relationship between the science that was going on largely under Ralph Barrick at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and Dr. Anthony Fauci at the NIAID. Those pieces of work giving rise to the 2003 patents I talked about before, which were the illegal patents on the coronavirus itself, show that the commercial exploitation of coronavirus has been with us in our population since 2001. And I want people to understand that. For the last 19 years, coronavirus hasn't been the subject of a research inquiry. It has been the subject of patented activity arising from federal sponsored research for commercial exploitation. 19 years. And if you look under each one of the threads, which we have now been untangling, because as I mentioned in my video two weeks ago on the butterfly of the week, I talked about the fact that we're very concerned about the interlocking directorates and the potential antitrust issues that come out of this whole thing. And the fact of the matter is, as we examine the evidence, what we find is that very early on, the researchers that were patenting coronavirus and the institutions that were funding it were in a lockstep to control the commercial exploitation of coronavirus as both a viral weaponized structure to harm, as well as a potential biologic agent to in fact use the coronavirus virology as a means of delivering other agents into the body. The theory being that if coronavirus is so easily brought into the cells, that it might be a good way to get other things into the cells. So it was actually being looked at as a, as a therapeutic agent. But I want to read you something really quickly. I just found this, and I think it's worth reading, and I'll send you this link, but it's, um, it's in an in a interview that was done in Nature magazine, which is not considered to be part of the, the extreme fringe of crazy, right? This right, is right, exactly. This yeah. line. I want to read the quote, this quote. The only impact of this work is the creation in a lab of a new non-natural risk. Richard E. Bright, molecular biologist and biodefense expert at Rutgers University told Nature. I want, I want you to just listen to that one more time just because that should be troubling to anyone who hears it. The outcome of this research, the impact of this work, is the creation in a lab of a new non-natural risk. What, what am I supposed to feel good about, knowing that the U.S. taxpayer dollars not only supported that, but the U.S. taxpayer dollars supported that since 2001, and specifically supported the development of a number of agents within the coronavirus family 
which very specifically were optimized for their virulence. I don't know any human being who can hear that sentence and not ask the question whether we get into the, the did it come out of a lab at US AMRED, did it come out of a lab at Fort Detrick's you know, uh, lab, did it come out of UNC Chapel Hill, did it come out of Wuhan? The, the question that humanity was asleep at the wheel on for 19 years was, our funds were being used to make an already dangerous virus in nature more dangerous. And none of us did, said, or concerned ourselves with it until the mind control exercise of 2019. And what makes matters worse is this letter, which I will also send you, Randy, so that you can post it. Good. This letter, dated October 21st, 2014, sent to the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, specifically as a result of the NIH determination that the work that was being done potentially was unethical. I want you to listen, and I want everybody to listen, because you can't make this up. It's that hideous. As your grant, this is, this is the letter that Department of Health and Human Services sent to researchers doing gain-of-function research, which is the increased virulence of, of the virus. Listen to what it says. As your grant is currently funded, this pause is voluntary. Organizations conducting gain-of-function research supported by the NIH have the opportunity to transition the applicable research to research that is not covered by the funding pause, halt the, gain, the applicable gain-of-function research until the outcome of deliberative processes are known, which by the way, we still haven't had the outcome of the deliberative processes, so just in case you're wondering, that hasn't happened. And here's the last one. Or, and remember, this is, this is the announcement of the moratorium on the research, so listen really carefully to option C. Or continue to conduct the applicable gain-of-function research, gain research until the end of the active budget. When we as a public decided it was unethical, the Department of Health and Human Services said, we'd like you to stop. But since you're already doing it, you don't really have to stop. But we need to tell the public that we told you to stop. But the stop isn't really stopping. It's more of a, we sent you a letter that said, please, we'll look the other way, don't really stop, but stop, but don't really stop. Like, that really happened on our watch. And none of us, none of us, none of us said, no, stop, because it's unethical. Stop, because it could be illegal. Stop, because it could violate all kinds of conventions. Stop means stop. But it doesn't mean stop. It specifically means, or you can just continue. So who was the regulatory agency in all of this anywhere? There's no watchdogs here. The Not CDC, no. yeah. the NIH, the NIAID, all of these alphabet agencies supposedly serving the public interest appear to be nothing more than a conglomerate of loosely affiliated intergovernmental bureaucrats operating side projects to what? enhance their credentials and fatten their bank accounts. So little soapbox because I don't get on soapboxes very often, but this is a soapbox. In 1979, because we were afraid the Japanese were overtaking us in science, we decided to pass a thing called the Bayh-Dole Act. And that was named after the two senators who sponsored the legislation. Mm -hmm. The Bayh-Dole Act made it legal for researchers to patent and commercially benefit from research done by the federal government sponsored programs. So National Institutes of Health, National Science Foundation, DARPA, all of these things. It became legal for academic institutions to get federal money to do research and have that research turn into the personal gain of the researcher and the corporate gain of the university. Now, that's called the Bayh Dole Act. You can go back and look at it. Yeah, it's uh, Senator Birch Bayh and Robert yeah. Dole. Yeah. Correct. 
Now, here's, here's the problem with what happened. And, and we're living with the consequence of the problem. When science is specifically linked to the commercial gain of the individual conducting the science, there is an inherent conflict that is necessarily in case, right? I'm going to choose to research topics that are going to be commercially viable. As I pointed out in the stat article I made reference to in this week's Butterfly of the Week um, on Monday, May the 4th, in the, the journal stat in February of 2020, Dr. Barrick and Dr. Anthony Fauci both were in an article bemoaning the absence of reliable funding for coronavirus research. They felt it was important that the funding levels rise because they are enriched when they rise. And Dr. Barrick, while that interview was taking place for that article, was sitting on the International Committee for the taxonomy of viruses, making the determination to call this a unique virus and the COVID-19 branded campaign what it is. Now, if he was in fact an independent objective observer, I would have less of a problem. But at the end of the ICTV paper, where authors are required to disclose whether they have financial or commercial interest, he declared none, despite the fact that he has the patents on coronavirus chimeric replication, on coronavirus detection, on coronavirus treatment, and he's actively engaged in the clinical trials of the compounds used to treat coronavirus. But at the end of the paper, where he and his partners at the ICTV's um, coronavirus study group, at the end of that paper, he attests to declaring no financial interest. I'd love to give him the benefit of the doubt, but here's where that falls apart. I can't, because in a public document, he, in fact, perjured himself by saying that he did not have a financial interest in creating the very basis upon which he would gain financial interest if this whole pandemic played out. You can't have it both ways. And my point is simple. Don't listen to me. Don't believe me. Don't agree with me. Go back and look at the evidence. The evidence is that commercial sponsorship of federally funded research to the tune of $458 million dollars has gone directly into the pockets of the individuals who architected this fraud. Okay, that, I mean, okay, okay, my mind was doing a million things while you were saying that. And right now we're just sort of looking at the morality around the financial aspect of this. But what you just talked about was loaded with so many things. It was like somebody spilled one a uh, drop of soda pop outside on the, the, the pavement and all the ants from the entire world came to feast on it. So I heard you say, and this is what my brain does with stuff because my brain looks for patterns and recognition of numbers. You said 2001, which is an interesting time when the Americans were put under a very particular type of hypnosis, which was 19 years ago, right? So maybe COVID-19 isn't only just about 2019, but the 19 years it took to get to this spot. It also harkens to 19 hijackers and in this, this, uh, this discussion that we've heard, we hear things like about invisible enemies that we're fighting right now, which is very similar to what we heard back then in 2019. And then you get into the conversation about the unique properties of this virus, that it, because it can carry things into the body that it's being used for therapeutic purposes. But where my mind goes with this, of course, is that some of the, uh, the uh, vaccines that are being researched or for use in this are uh, like a kind of RNA or DNA type of uh, vaccines, but there's also one that involves some kind of electro electronic pulse that will break down the cell wall so things can be introduced through the cell wall that aren't supposed to be in there. So I don't know if that would be considered therapeutic use or introducing something else uh, into the body and into the cells. At the same time, 
while all of this is going on, we've been watching for a couple of years a push for a vegan agenda, which is does not provide a human's body with the kind of cholesterol necessary for cell wall integrity. And while all this is going on, we're being told that there's a meat shortage, so we're not gonna have enough meat, and we're all gonna start having to eat Impossible Burgers, and, right? And this all kind of circles back to the same body of interests that profit. So it's kind of like they're profit off of every angle of this. They create the problem, they solve the problem, they have every little facet of every, I mean, the number of ants that are there eating off of the one drop of sugar and, and you know, this, and, and multiplying it is just like, it's a beehive like I've never seen. So, off of this, am I, am, I, am I on track with some of this here? So, so here, here's, here's one of the challenges. The challenge is that we're in a time and we've been in this time now, I would say for the last probably 30 years formally, yeah. where the degree to which we have any level of independent means of verification is unfortunately hijacked by a commercial corruption of any level of independence. So when, when somebody says, you know, and I've had people actually good friends over the last couple of weeks say I'm downplaying the severity of a thing. I'm going to address that point, point blank. I am not downplaying the severity of the fact that as a species, we are getting more immune compromised. We are seeing an increased number of things, including GI problems that are systemic obesity problems that are systemic, industrial chemicals entering into the food supply that are systemic. There are a host of things that are in fact happening and we have been deluded into this notion that there somewhere is, to Randy's earlier point, there's, there's this kind of loosely affiliated alphabet soup of organizations, FDA, NIH, CDC, all of these things who are somehow looking out for us but to Randy's question and to your question, there is no citizen oversight mm -hmm. that is economically disincentivized to come up with whatever the theory is. You mentioned veganism and, and in my book that's now just days away from being released, which I'm very excited about, Lizards Eat Butterflies, a super book. And which but you will come back to talk to us about. One I'm of absolutely going to come yes. back to talk about um, th this one, if, if you want me to kick every, every sacred cow, I, I have obliged. The, the book is, leaves no one unoffended. Um, and, and part of that is by design. Part of that is because I'm 53 and I'm done caring about, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but, um, but the interesting thing is, I, I point out that the kale, let's just pick one, right? Right. Kale which we now know is the wonder food of wonder foods and, and it's the most amazing thing and, and, and you can't be cool if you don't have at least one serving of kale a day and you need whatever. Kale is a very interesting problem because the butterfly that actually eats kale is quite sensitive to Bacillus thuringiensis or BT. Now most people don't think about or don't hear about or don't know what BT is but Bacillus thuringiensis is a bacterium that's particularly good at getting into plants and modifying the plant DNA. You've heard of BT corn and yep. BT cotton and genetically modified this yep. and that and the other thing. 100 years ago, hear what I'm saying. 100 years ago, Japanese researchers found that Bacillus thuringiensis has a particularly interesting effect on the gut of insects. It actually makes their guts leak and therefore they die. Mm -hmm. It turns out, are you ready for this? That organic certification includes spraying crops yep. with BT. Yep. Okay. And the crop that is most likely to be exposed to the highest levels of Bacillus thuringiensis happens to be the poster child crop mm -hmm. of every cool California salad on the planet. Yep. Now, I only bring this up to say that 100 years ago, a group of Japanese researchers knew that BT 
had a very good pesticidal function. Okay. And, and they said, man, we'd love to have our, our kale and we'd love to have our cauliflower and we'd love to have our broccoli not eaten by those little pesky white butterflies and their caterpillars. The problem is that the solution introduced something that according to every food regulatory agency on the planet was safe for human consumption. Mm -hmm. You ready for this? There are studies, many of them, that have shown that the increase in BT use in agriculture has directly risen with the amount of irritable bowel yep. and disruptive GI systems and so forth. Now, yeah. I'll be the first to criticize myself in saying, I'm not saying it's causative because I don't know. I haven't done my own independent research on this. I have read the research on it, but here's my point, Randy. And it's so critical that we get this point and Emily's spot on. The problem is we're left in a vacuum of partial truths that are sponsored by undisclosed interests. We do not have an independent verification mechanism. And unfortunately, as we've seen the Googleification of the world, we have not considered the fact that Google as a search engine curates the content that most people think is the only accessible content. So if I go and look up, is BT safe? I am not only not going to get independent information, I'm going to get curated information where the disclosure of that information and its selection for curation has never been independently verified, which is the reason why you see me holding up things like, are you ready for this? Paper, you know why? <laughs> I actually have to go and pull documents that are not indexed on websites yeah. that are not available on a commercially curated search engine. I have to go get source documents because I get told, oh, Dave, you're downplaying the severity of a thing. No, I'm not. I'm actually calling people out on the fact that they manufactured an illusion and then layered the illusion on a very convenient phenomenon called about 80 to 90,000 people dying of atypical pneumonia. And to everybody who says that, that I'm wrong about the SARS virus and that I'm wrong about COVID-19, the terrible reality is we still have not crossed the death threshold for atypical pneumonia from 2017, 2018, which was our highest hospitalization year. We still haven't crossed that threshold. And I never saw a single camera in a single emergency room or in a single ICU in 27, 2018, yep. breathlessly telling us that we should all wear masks and be socially distant. And I'm asking for a simple thing, which is integrity. If we really have something that is anything other than a commercial fraud, prove it. This day, this moment, CDC only count the number of deaths that are tested with scanning microscopy, which is the only way you can actually confirm that a virus and its genome are present in the system. Do that and I'll shut up. But until then, you can't shut me up because as long as you pad the numbers, I'm gonna be ripping them apart. So who becomes the issue? In the process of this lockdown, and quarantine and all of the social distancing and the fact that hospital physician reporting numbers are so questionable. A, we now have a polluted data pool. There is no clean data to be vetted. They polluted their own data pool. And I've pointed this out repeatedly in posts that I've made because there are some physicians and practitioners in my circle of friends and to continuously point out you have no reliable reporting because once you contaminate your data pool, unless you can purge that and clean that data, it's worthless. Correct. Second and is that they reverse the entire process of treating what would be called an epidemic or pandemic by reversing the equation, you do not quarantine healthy people, you quarantine sick people, which goes back to how do we test 
who is sick. It's now presumed that everybody is sick. Correct. And, and, and here's how sick this is. I got an email from a friend of mine this morning, a guy I really love, who said to me, let's have breakfast on Sunday if you don't mind wearing a mask. And I replied back to him, email, first, it's Mother's Day. Secondly, we'll have breakfast together when the mask thing has gone away because I'm not wearing a mask to have a meal and sit and talk to somebody that I've known for 40 years. And, th and so we have this complete train wreck where there's no data, there's no integrity. We have a berserk government system that has locked us down and justified it using the contaminated data that you've talked about. How do we untangle this for the average person who's sitting there scared shitless, mm -hmm. locked up in their house with their mask on, believing that they're going to be invaded at any second by an airborne pathogenic virus? By the invisible enemy, yes. Yeah, you know, invisible enemy. You know, Randy and Emily, I have been intrigued by the degree to which we've latched on to, as this broader society, we've latched on to a narrative that fear means isolation. If, if we think from a, from a sense of what most evolutionary psychologists would describe the natural human tribe, they would say that at points of extreme stress, what made the human species work is that we banded together, mm. right? The, the evolutionary mandate in any evolutionary system, by the way, is not to isolate. The evolutionary mandate, whether you are the newborn gazelle and the, the herd of gazelles sees a lion pack approaching, right? This is not a, let's all split up. In fact, the response, if you want an evolutionary success, is you bring things together mm -hmm. and you corral those people who do not have the capacity to defend or, or to be resilient. You corral and support them, right? So the whole idea is the strong and the capable of defense mount that outer ring, but they do it together. They do it standing together. This is explicitly not a public health viral based outbreak. This is, as I've said for as long as I've been talking about it, this is a social engineering experiment. Yep. Yes. To not see, I mean, the, the, here's, the, here's the terrible thing. The outcome is we as a species has been indicted that said the minute you instill a drop of fear, we can all be cowed into locking into our homes, right? That, that is not the design. That was an accidental anecdotal finding. The design was how easily can we promulgate a single story and have it turn into a crowd control mechanism? Yep. Go back to event 201 and look at what they said in phase two. In phase two, they said that it would be incumbent on social media and media outlets to do rolling blackouts or suppression of counter stories. Now that was done at the event 201 a couple mm -hmm. months before allegedly all this happened. And they, they, they laid out in a sequence the natural progression of how one would go about controlling this experiment. People need to understand that anyone who says that they're fa wearing face masks or they're social distancing for the benefit of their neighbors or the benefit of their family needs to explain to me why in 2017 and 2018, when we had a higher total number of atypical pneumonia, higher number of influenza cases, they were not doing the same thing. And I will only accept a face mask and I will only accept social distancing from people who practiced it when they didn't have mind control yep. imposed on them. You show me your picture of you in 2017 at Christmas with a face mask and I'll eat with you with a face mask. <laughs> so if you can't produce Perfect. that picture and there were more people dead and there were more people dying of atypical pneumonia, then I'm not going to listen to you. And, and that's where it comes down to just calling it what it is. This is a branded campaign where somebody opportunistically has decided 
to exercise a mind control exercise. Mm -hmm. And that exercise is overtly suppressing liberty. It's overtly distancing people from the capacity to engage in thoughtful dialogue. And the only mode of communication turns into, are you ready for this? Something curated through an authorized channel called Facebook or YouTube. That curation is not independent. It is built on an architecture that is scraping personal information, financial information, and everything else. And that information is being scraped for the benefit of very knowable and disclosable parties. Financial institutions, the individual corporations and their shareholders, and the agencies to whom they are beholden, which include all of the alphabet soups that are out there. So the fact of the matter is, we are being put through, without our consent, we are being put through a human experiment where the actual variables are crowd control and psychological manipulation. And we are actually failing the human evolutionary test, which says that when we are put against distress, we should unite. Yep. So you just brought up something that leads me perfectly into sort of where I wanted to, to wrap up this segment. What you said about the 2017 pneumonia issue. In, in 2017, my father got pneumonia. And, uh, when he returned from a trip to China, he, from, from China, he was sick. And I was up in Northern California and I left early and rushed back to see him in the hospital where I wasn't asked to wear a face mask either for his protection or for mine. He actually had pneumonia and he was in the hospital. Right now, he's, you know, I finally got to see him about a week and a half ago for the first time in six weeks because he's afraid, <laughs> right? And, um, you know, so it's interesting that when he had pneumonia, he wasn't worried about his health or mine in that situation. Neither were the doctors, so that was perfect. Yep. But, you know, I shared with him your video, not this week's video, but last week's video, the one that got 200,000 views on YouTube. And um, he thought, you know, my father is a smart man. My father has multiple degrees from UCLA, including a law degree and a PhD from the University of London, right? He's a smart man. And his response to what you said in that video was that uh, you brought up some interesting points. He thought you were smart and you speak with authority and all that kind of stuff, but that he's sure that if the things you're saying are true, the ACLU will do something about it. And, you know, that kind of broke my heart. And then he declined to watch the interview that we had done with you last week. He, you know, he, he said he'd pass on that. Um, he seems to be having some small shifts sometimes. I, I love my father. He's my favorite person in the world. You know, we do disagree at this point on almost everything. Um, but can, can you just, for the people out there who think that's true, explain why the ACL, ACLU is not going to do anything about this and why, it is, we, why it's important for each of us to actually know these things. At some point, not knowing shit became a virtue, right? And some of the smartest people, supposedly, that I know don't seem to know anything. Um, can you just speak to that for a minute? Well, I think that we... Um, we have suffered over the last probably two decades with exceptionally, exceptionally um, heavily influenced, if not outright bought, and, and, and I can separate those two things, a judiciary that has not necessarily made the law and the enforcement of the law a priority. We have suffered from a situation where the pay to play version of justice is venue selective, is topic selective, is extremely subject to a level of inaccessibility where the notion of due process has long left the building. If you are capable of accessing legal representation in a venue that is actually roughly sympathetic to the law, you are in the minority now. The American Civil Liberties Union was given all, all of this information when I surfaced it for the very first time. The American Civil Liberties Union said, please file an additional complaint through another portal, which I did. The U.S. Attorney's offices, where, where I have taken every one of these particular allegations, the U.S. Attorney's offices all have the information, all have access to the information. And here's a tiny little problem and and i want to make sure we're clear on on the, the the normal distribution of people in every profession we somehow think that when it comes to lawyers or judges 
all of them are at the upper right distribution of they must be really smart or doctors. You know, they all must be smart. Yep. But like every other profession, there are really good ones. Then there's a big, giant, fat middle curve of kind of the okay ones. And then there's the other tail of the distribution, which are just total crap. The number of people who have said, well, why doesn't a lawyer take this on? Well, that's an interesting question, but why doesn't an epidemiologist challenge the, the IMHE uh, at University of Washington? Why doesn't an epidemiologist challenge jo Johns Hopkins? Why doesn't an epi epidemiologist cha challenge the Imperial College of, of, of London? And the answer, Emily, is because it robs your future rice bowl of the donations you're going to get for being complicit. If you are a lawyer right now and you take on this case, you know what you're not going to get? You're not going to get awarded. You're not going to get recognized for your patriotism. You're not going to get recognized for how amazing you were at upholding the law. You are going to get vilified and worse than that, your livelihood in the future is going to be cut off because it turns out that if you become a voice for those who are in fact the voiceless masses of the citizens, you no longer get the primary contracts and the primary engagements and the primary retainers down the road. And the challenge is, in my view, is to find people which, by the way, are in exceptionally short supply across the board find people who are willing to say that the price of liberty, the price of liberty is the engagement at risk of your identity, at risk of your reputation, at risk of the fact that maybe you won't be liked. It turns out that patriotism has never been born of complicity. Patriotism has always been born of people who are willing to take at the time a stand that is unpopular. And unfortunately, I am still looking two weeks and counting. So you know what? Like I said before, it took 19 years for this conspiracy to play out. The fact that I'm two weeks into looking for a lawyer, I can't moan about. But the fact is that we're living in a time where very few people understand that this is not about their individual interest and this is not about their individual reputation. This is about standing for the collective of humanity and drawing a line that says, we will not see our liberty taken. There aren't many individuals who have the economic or the social or the moral fiber to make that statement absolutely. I'm calling for them. I'm looking for them. And the fact is, I am so encouraged that video that you talked about that now has over a half a million viewers on YouTube and Facebook combined. That video has led to over 2,000 people that I have been informed of downloading the documents off of YouTube, sending those documents to the ACLU, to attorneys general, to governor's offices, to congressmen and women, to senators, to local mayors. I have been overwhelmed by the fact that albeit small and we can sit back and say well it's only 2,000 you know what I don't look at it that way I look at it and say there are 2,000 or 3,000 people who have taken the courageous step to say I do have a voice my voice does matter and I am going to do what I can do to inform those who are in positions of authority that I'm actually watching I'm paying attention and this is not going to happen on our collective watches. And do you realize that to your credit and to Randy's credit and to the credit of a few other individuals who have been so dynamic in helping get this message out, that there are half a million people who have responded to the message. But out of a half a million people, if you look at the comments on Facebook and you look at the comments on YouTube, not 99%, something well north of 99% have been positive, have been statements of gratitude, and have been affirmations. And the number of total jerks that just go, 
you know, wanker conspiracy theorist, you know, crazy, whatever else. That number is so infinitely small that I have stopped believing the numbers that say that the majority of Americans somehow want to keep the lockdown going or keep face masks going because the sample size of a half a million Americans who have not only liked, but shared and commented and expressed gratitude for what I'm doing and what you're doing. The fact of the matter is we're not alone and we have to stop pretending like we have our tail between our legs. We are the masses, we are the people, and we have the ability to stand and say, hey, you know what? Things aren't dark and grim because there are a number of people who are taking action in their communities, in their towns, and I'm all about supporting them and recognizing that the more we give credence to the possibility that exists with the people who are willing to be switched on, the stronger we as a people will be. That's probably the best place to leave this segment. This is actionable information. David, anything else you want to, you want to first off, let people know where they can find you and also anything you want to be heard saying going out on this segment. Yeah, really quick. Uh, David Martin world on YouTube, uh, David Martin dot world on the World Wide web. You can find my content. You can see me there. Um, we have backup videos if we ever have any issues. So far, we haven't. We're very fortunate. We've been able to keep our message very clear, stick to the facts, get information out there, um, and at least make the fact checkers jobs a little more difficult because they have to fact check. And that's a bummer because we're giving them facts. Um, so uh, all that's out there. Um, and, and what I would like to say as a single parting message is that five weeks ago, I had a community of probably three or 4,000 fans around the world that pretty much, you know, when I'd say something, they go, man, that guy's cool. We like what he said. Um, on the back of a message built on integrity, on respecting the intellects of people from all spectrums of life, I have seen that number grow to hundreds of thousands. I am humbled by that. I am honored by that. And I want to be abundantly clear on the fact that as long as there are people of goodwill, and by the way, I've looked at so many of your Facebook pages and YouTube pages and everything else, and man, some of the stuff you guys are into, mind blown. I have had my mind open to stuff I didn't know about, groups I had no idea existed, um, causes that I didn't know about. You, you, the listeners, have fueled the flame of liberty in me. I want every crazy, I want every patriot, I want every Second Amendment, Fifth Amendment, Tenth. If you love liberty, I don't care what flavor you come in. Because what I have come to realize over the last few weeks is that the flame of liberty is fueled by a fuel that is so plural and is so rich and diverse that we need to be beyond the simple labels. Man, we've got to get past it. Because if we get past it, then we can't be controlled by the mind control of a single message. If we allow each other to have the liberty that we all enjoy, then it can't be taken from us when somebody plucks on a virus or on the internet or on a phone or on TV or wherever they choose to go because we'll be stronger than that. And I'm so honored to stand with such an amazing group of crazy, beautiful, wonderful patriots and it's an honor to serve. And I am so grateful to you guys for making this opportunity happen again. Thanks, David. All right, that's going to wrap up the segment Off Planet Radio. Um, patreon.com forward slash off planet media is where you can find the support page and we're going to flip over to the other side the truth is out there let's get crazy we'll see you on the flip flop this is off planet radio Thank you.